Today on the Dolby Creator Talks podcast, we welcome cinematographer Hoyta Van Hoytema to discuss his incredible work on Oppenheimer, for which Hoyta has received his second Academy Award nomination. This is all part of our continuing coverage of the 2024 Academy Awards. We are once again talking with the nominees in the sound and cinematography categories, as well as best original score. So please make sure you are subscribed to us. Oppenheimer is leading the pack in nominations this year with 13, including Hoyta's best cinematography nomination. But I wanted to start this conversation way before he became an A-list Oscar-nominated cinematographer by asking him about his superhero origin story to find out how he got into the film industry in the first place. Well, it's, it's very far from being a superhero origin story. It's, um, it's um, I went to uh, uh, do entrance exam at a Dutch film school at some point. I, I, I knew for a while then that I wanted to become a filmmaker. I got uh, turned down twice, two years in a row. Um, out of desperation, uh, sadly, I went to Poland, um, where there's another film school, and uh, I applied there, and, and I was accepted there. And uh, I spent four or five years in Poland um, when I felt myself ready for my career and ready to go out in the world and um, mesmerize everybody with my work. I, after that, I kind of spent like six years being unemployed, smoking cigarettes on a couch. <laughs> and then at some point, my career started rolling a little bit. And um, and from when it started rolling a little bit and picked up momentum, I kind of haven't stopped ever since. So you, you certainly have not stopped ever since. Uh, you collaborated with Christopher Nolan now on four films. Tell me a little bit about how the process starts. He shows you a script. Um, what, what was your first reaction to reading the Oppenheimer script and how do you start figuring out how you're going to accomplish this? Yeah, I, you know, we have done four films together. So when Chris comes with a new script, he's, he's, he's usually, um, it starts with a lunch. You know, we, we go and have a lunch together and he says, I got something new. You want to come in and read it, which you then do. You come in and read it. And I think for me, uh, more and more, it has become the key to, you know, just not try to be too smart and too analytical from sort of the, 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 the beginning, from the outset. It's like, I know by now that his scripts are so rich and they're so full of detail and they also uh, have a lot of complexity. Uh, and they have a lot of, you know, physical problems to to overcome, uh, technical problems to overcome. And uh, I have the feeling, you know, I'm, I always try to read the script as intuitive as I can, um, as sort of naked and bare, um, you know, and 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 kind of let the script work on you as a final film would work on any any audience. Because that's kind of the only time that you that you will have that view upon the script. To the moment that you really start into to get into the nitty gritty of it, that that that, that sort of honeymoon is kind of over, you know. So uh, uh, and then and then after after reading that script, we talk about it, and then it's very much about you know taking one step at a time. You know, we very slowly start to sort of tip our toes into the material that we know is going to be extremely complex. And slowly, you know, we start problem solving. And then, you know, we, we, we're every day sitting in the same office. We start our conversations and we start sort of the process. And the process is like a mixture of, you know, uh, solving technical problems as well as, you know, talking sometimes a little bit more about philosophical things, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it's never a lot at the same time. It's, 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 it's always very sort of um, one step at a time and pragmatic in a way. When you read Oppenheimer, what did anything leap out at you immediately as, as, oh, this is going to be an interesting daunting thing to figure out the most interesting and daunting thing when when for me was when i read oppenheimer was not so so much like oh this is going to be big because we're going to have a uh, explosions and we have to do um 
you know, physics. I mean, for me, it was very much that it was one of these scripts that was so much dialogue based and so much, um, you know, was playing in, 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 in people talking in small rooms and automatically, you know, that sort of started to take place as the big challenge of this film, you know, because it, it was, a, it was, it was, you know, in a way for the films we had done before, it was not necessarily a safe space. It was a, it, that was definitely sort of a new, a new adventure for, for us, I think. I, I would love to dig into that a little bit more. One of the things I find fascinating about this film is, is how you and, and Christopher Nolan are, uh, you, you have such contrast of scale. You have, you know, you built the town of Los Alamos. You, you staged the first atomic explosion, but the film starts and ends with close-ups. As you say, there's so much dialogue. There's so many close-ups in the film. And then a, a huge, a huge portion of the film takes place in this hearing space, which is described in, in, in the film as a, a, a shabby little room far from the limelight. Uh, I want to talk about that room for a second because so much of the film takes place in there. And I, I can imagine, you know, it's, you've got characters against a blank white wall. Like <laughs> how did you approach knowing how much of the film is going to happen in that hearing space, making it visually interesting and, 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 and uh, having it sit within the rest of the film. I was scared shitless in the beginning because, because, because you, because you, you know, you are very much out of your comfort zone, you know, um, in the old days when in doubt, you know, uh, throw in a wide shot, you know, throw in a vista and give the people breathing space, etc. But this was full on very um, intense uh, on the human face all the time. Um, uh, so there was a challenge, uh, but also I think you, uh, a very fun one. It definitely um, brings you to sort of a state of mind where you have to really uh, start to focus on what is being said, you know, and on the and on the progression of the story and where you are in the story in time. Um, you know, you 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 have to rely on that, and then you know, in a way, you have to sort of. Uh, put yourself into sort of that hypersensitive mode where you, uh, you know, where you enslave your, uh, your work um, as much to that principle to empower those words very much, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I always, I always have the feeling that, that, that with this film, Sort of the the power of the close up or, or the 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 way uh, how interesting those close ups are. They were very much reliant on where those were placed in the story, and then where you were as an audience in your story, and with that also what we as an audience project into those faces. You know, you look you 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 look into those eyes and you you see an expression and you see a state of mind, but very often what sort of happens behind uh, somebody's eyes inside somebody's head is much more interesting and and sort of the will to 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 grasp that or to grapple or to stay on par with the thought process of a character it's it's a very powerful motor and it's very um, interesting uh, it's a it's a very big element in it's, to keep you in a way interested as an audience so so that became very much sort of you know, almost a, you know, you know, sort of a beacon of light for the cinematography as well. You know, mm. where are we in the story? What is he thinking? And what do we want to think when we look at his face? You know, yeah. Um, as well as, you know, I always like to say, you know, in this film, our faces became our landscapes. Uh, you know, we, we couldn't re rely on the, on the whiteness. So, you know, I did very hard my best to make those faces as interesting as possible to look at, you know. Probably one of the challenges for you on this film was the fact that you were going to finish it completely photochemically. You were going to cut negative. You know, everything uh, had to had to happen in an, in an optical and, and photochemical process. Was that, I mean, how, I, I can only imagine what that must have posed for you in terms of the challenge of not having any of the digital tools to, to, to lean on, uh, with, especially with a shoot as complex as this. Can you talk about that? Alleged beauty or uh, power of this film very much comes from that choice. Um, <clears throat> I think the fact that we kept things very much in an analog space was very crucial to 
to, I think, our human connection with the story and our human connection with, for instance, the physics in the story as well, you know, the tangible physics. Um, uh, I, I, I very often, you know, I, I very often believe that, you know, uh, digital tools are very often grabbed just, just because they are more convenient, you know, uh, but they're not necessarily better. You know, they are not necessarily uh, uh, more uh, speaking or more soulful or carry carry more weight than, for instance, uh, physical effects or you know, uh, light project on an analog film. So, so in a way, I just had the feeling that if we can sort of handle to uh, step away from the more comfortable way of doing it and just trying to stick to our guns and, 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 and try to be as pure as possible, that somehow this will start speaking to an audience as well, you know. So, so it's not really done from some sort of a place of self-indulgement indulge, or the fact that we sort of created rules for ourselves because... It, it is not a rule for ourselves. It's just literally that we purely always try to choose what we think looks the best and works the best. You talked about practical effects, and uh, I, I want to ask about that because one of the things that I found so fascinating, I had the opportunity to sit down with a sound team, and we talked a lot about, about how the sound uh, was critical in getting inside the mind of J. Robert Oppenheimer. But I think visually you're doing that too. He seems to have the ability to see quantum physics. And so you have a number of practical gags that you do in the film to kind of communicate that. Um, and I love the way, you know, as he gets, you know, in these moments when he gets very tense and upset, you know, what you do with the backgrounds. Could you talk about the development of the look of those those particular sequences and the practicality of how you accomplish them? Yeah. And, 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 and by the way, this is kind of a continuation of what we started to talk about, about, you know, um, keeping close-ups interesting and, you know, project what what we project on faces is also you know there's an offering in this film in which we sometimes get to to peek uh, into somebody's mind right and 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 it was for us very important that we felt that kind of excess from time to time or that we at least felt from time to time that we had you know did we got some sort of insight on how he started to perceive the world and also how the world around him was slowly changing. So, so you know, we 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 used a lot of different, you know, uh, tool, tools to uh, to try to achieve that. And and one of those tools is, of course, those 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 physics visions that were very much uh, done with the help of uh, Andrew Jackson, brilliant visual effects supervisor, and Scott Fisher, who who had designed all kind of physics experiments for us you know that and 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 endlessly kept filming like particles smashing into each other or things um uh, next to the set but 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 all these all these effects they were all based on sort of uh yeah physical uh phys physical experiments and we would watch them uh in dailies every day after the sh after the shoot and 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 so we also allowed ourselves to get some sort of a an idea of uh, or a visualization of 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 of, of the, the 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 essential physics in the, in 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 the film, and then there's these moments that you describe uh, in which we see the background, for instance, behind him changing. You know, um, the scintillation of the of the matter. You know, uh, that realization that you know for him uh, the world is not uh, built out of solid matter but it's built out of waves and wavelengths and scintillating uh, uh, fre frequencies um so you know uh, together with andrew jackson we came up with uh, ways to do that as well which you which you see in the film here and there tell me a little bit about the decision to um basically lewis strauss's kind of storyline as presented in black and white and um was that something that was in the original script from christopher nolan or did it was you... yes okay yes okay 
And, and tell me about narratively what that accomplished. I mean, from an audience member, it helped me kind of orient myself and make sure that I understand where I am in the timeline of all this. But from a narrative standpoint, I'm kind of curious creatively what that what that did for you. And then also, you know, I, I understand that that created some challenges for you in terms of you had to develop, <laughs> you had to get Kodak to yeah. develop a, a, a 65 millimeter IMAX, you know, black and white stock, right? Yeah, let, let me start with script that uh, Chris Chris did something very interesting in, in, in the Oppenheimer script that is that, you know, uh, the, the, the Oppenheimer storyline, he uh, wrote uh, all in the first person. Uh, I see this, I do this, I do that, which was not necessarily <coughs> for us uh, to you know, shoot it all as a point of view of him. But it was very much for us, the, the people that started working on the script, I think the sound people and Ludwig, the composer and Jen, the editor, to understand really what the perspective has to be, you know, the, uh, whose world are we viewing, which was our, our, our color world. And it was, you know, Oppenheimer and the way that Oppenheimer starts to see the world differently. And then there's the straw storyline, which which was all it was just described in the beginning somewhere, black and white, you know, blah blah blah. Louis Strauss, um, which was in a way it was written much more objective. You know, we 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 didn't necessarily want to see Strauss's point of view on the physics of the world changing. Um, um, so 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 Chris have decided to make that separation there for us to sort of understand clearly where we were and and which point of view in an emotional way as well we wanted we wanted to follow and wanted to stay true to so so Strauss's storyline all black and white um, uh, yeah we 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 uh, uh, we started to investigate in the beginning how to do that and um, uh, uh, as you know we we love the big format very much, you know, the six, six, system 65, five perf, but we also love uh, 15 perf very much IMAX. And, you know, we love to shoot as much as possible on that, um, you know, for many, many different reasons. And, and we can come back to that. But uh, uh, um, uh, truth is the, the, the film stock didn't exist for this. You know, uh, and also, you know, uh, by now, you know, our love for analog film and uh, and our the, the love for our analog post-process, for instance. Um, so we had to ask Kodak if they could manufacture that film, uh, which they uh, said they could, you know, um, after some light hesitation, of course, because it turns out... It turns out it was a much, uh, yeah, much more difficult process than we than we imagined. Um, you know, uh, they had to create different backings for the film. The film itself is 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 physically it has a, it has a different width to it. Um, uh, the way the, the softness, the hardness of emulsion is very important as well uh, when you spread it over a big a bigger area. So. So all these uh, these things they had a lot of a lot of effect for instance on the cameras itself. So we had to re-engineer the cameras a little bit. We had to build new gates for the cameras, for instance, or new pressure plates for the cameras uh, because the old pressure plates, the chrome pressure plates, started bleeding a lot of light onto the onto the film stock, and 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 so the 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 the, the cameras they were re-engineered, and then we had the whole lab department that had never done it and that has one workflow for color and that's it so they had to develop a way in which they could change their machines from black and white into color or from color into black and white which involved installation of gigantic tanks and all that kind of stuff they and they <coughs> and and a month uh, or months of testing and experimenting so what we what we what we in a way thought was was kind of a you know, okay, let's just shoot it on black and white. It it just became this gigantic operation of a lot of a lot of people, a lot of great engineers, you know, to do it for us. But you know, when we saw the uh, the first close up on a test for the first time, that the you know when when, when we shot, uh, I mean, we were we were we were sold. We were so in love. So uh, 
So I'm, I'm, I'm super stoked and super happy that people went through all these lengths uh, to do it. But of course, um, you know, the black and white material, you're printing back onto color stock for your release print. So did that create any, what issues did that create for you? It's hard to grade it. You know, it's very hard to uh, take the color out when you essentially uh, regulate in the print your exposure uh, with, uh, you know, your three colors of light. So, so once you, once you uh, print, print your film, you, you, you will get a black and white result, but you know, it's very hard to get, get it not leaning towards a tint of magenta or a tint of green, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that became a big challenge, but we also learned something or uh, uh, something important during that process as well. And that is that, you know, black and, the way you perceive black and white or pure black and white uh, has very much to do with, you know, the colors you see prior to that. Like for instance, if you, if you, have pure black and white, uh, right? Um, and you have a scene before that that is all happening in a, on a green grass field in the green, and you cut to that black and white after, you'll see that black and white as magenta. So the 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 the, the color control in there actually gave us an, an an extra tool in order to be able to perceive that black and white that would follow as pure black and white because actually it was it was printed on color stock we've talked a lot about the close-ups and your your choices to shoot on the <coughs> imax and the and the, the panavision 65 format i've seen these crazy photos on the set of you with the massive imax camera mounted on your shoulder right and the actors faces i'm kind of curious um how did they respond to that what, what did that affect their performance obviously you know it's it's a noisy contraption. So how did you help them kind of get into the mental space where they needed to be to for their performances with all all of that going on on the set? You know, actors are are a little bit like um, like everybody that is working on the set, right? You 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 work to a common goal and you choose very specific tools for very specific reasons. And Chris and I were very committed to this format, and 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 you know, we always manage to sort of convince people why this will give us the right window into the reality. And of course, when an actor comes with a set for the first time with no experience in IMAX, it's intimidating because it's noisy, you know, and it's, and, and, and they have to adapt the way that they would do it like with, uh, with, a, with a silent camera. But, you know, a lot of actors, they also very used to shoot two camera uh, shoots or to adapt their performance for close-ups very much or, uh, um, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of different ways of acting for different cameras, for three camera shoots or what. But but I think I think you know um, it's very obviously when they come to the set that we're very committed and they they are d doing and trying their best to understand that format and to adapt whatever they they do. It's it's not an easy camera to forget because it's big and it's noisy, but at the same time. You know, uh, you're also working with great and professional actors, and 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 they're very good at what they do, and 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 uh, uh, I think they get used to it. You know, like like you get used to everything. You you it's it's kind of parts of our job is to overcome these kind of complex technologies and inconvenient uh, ways to offer the audience in the end sort of the best viewing. Um, experience uh, that we know and that's kind of what we do all day it's like you know overcoming these uh, these um, hinders you touched a little bit on the grading process when we were talking about the black and white photography and i'd, I'd like to come back to that um i'm just kind of curious what your experience was and how was it for you you know you don't have the ability to, to use power windows to knock down specific elements in your frame you're kind of it's been a yeah you know, i've been around long enough to remember what it was like to time photochemically in the lab uh, what was it like coming back to that experience for you and not having those digital tools to lean on in the grading process? I love it for many different reasons. I mean, one thing that I really love with um, the analog grading process is that you're effectively um, grading real time. You know, you uh, uh, opposed to a digital process where you put your um, your film in a DI suite, you you always progress shot by shot by shot by shot. So you work on a shot. 
and you 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 try to sort of insert you know all your ideas about uh, aesthetics onto that frame, and then you start working with power windows, and you start darken up and brighten things, and it gives you very very much control, but you never really are forced to watch your film as a as a as a whole the way an audience would watch it whereas when you color grade analog basically you you put your film up on a projector and you sit in uh, in 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 a, in a in a cinema seat the way an audience would sit and you start playing your film and so your response on you know the the visuals of your your your, 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 your of the visuals of the film is a very sort of intuitive one and it's a very uh uh direct one and 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 one that is very much dependent on 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 the timeline and where you are in the time and where you're emotionally in the film so to say so uh so i i i love i love that process because of that and i love the fact that it is so direct and it is so much uh so close to uh how how we experience watching a film you know now, uh, of course, doing an analog color process, uh, a lot of the control of your images is not uh, in the DI suite, you know, it's not afterwards. And if you're not successful in controlling that, then you have to better accept the, 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 the roughness or the grittiness of the result later, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, so so in one hand, I, I think it brings the control of the film uh, uh, very much there where you need to assert a lot of control. Then the grading becomes very intuitive um, and the end result is often uh, not as polished. But uh, I think that's a plus too. You know, I, 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 I hate seeing things where you where you really can feel the you know the sort of the control freakishness or the ADD of the DP asserted over 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 images that are supposed to be very sort of heartful and, and soulful, you know. So in that way, it's 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 kind of all a plus for me, you know. I I, I kind of think that this whole process <coughs> just creates images that we relate to much in a much warmer way uh, than um, than doing the DI route. Now that being said, you know, people are experiencing the film in a variety of different formats. Some are some are having the great pleasure of seeing it in 70 in, in, in IMAX, uh, others on 70 millimeter, uh, and others are seeing it, you know, in a, a DCI grade in a, a digital cinema. Uh, and it's it does exist in Dolby Vision. Uh, in both the cinema and the home versions. I'm kind of curious about your experience with Dolby Vision and sort of uh, how you kind of moved Oppenheimer through the, the the video finishing process and working in Dolby Vision. We start with sort of our mother format, right? That's, that's, that's where it all starts. And that is very much what do we like best? Uh, what do we feel you know, works, works for us? And, and what's the way we would want to see this film? So, so um, so we start with, with, with exposing the film on, 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 on you know, 15 perf and 5 perf, 70 millimeter, and we do this analog process. But we're very much aware that, you know, most people will not see it on 70 millimeter, um, you know, either on IMAX or on a 70 millimeter per, uh, 5 perf projector. Uh, so after that process, and when we have really our finished, you know, beloved uh, format, uh, we start to derive all the all the um, uh, all the digital versions of it, you know, and that's you know that's 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 a whole lot of work, and we rely a lot on um, <coughs> on uh, on uh, Costas Teodosiu uh, um, from Photochem, who is creating all this digital uh, 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 derived versions from fr from the analog uh, version and he does that you know they, they they they're preparing sort of a space for us or a suite in which they can project the analog version uh, uh, next to the you know the, the the grading projection of the digital version and so he very meticulously tries to emulate that. And very often that that doesn't mean that he's just copying from frame to frame, but he has to sort of interpret a little bit 
of how you know how certain you know contrast levels or translate to certain digital uh, digital versions you know like for instance you know um, <coughs> to, to, for, for 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 Dolby, he has to do very different things than, for instance, for a normal normal DCP. So he's tirelessly he's he's like working on all these versions. And for us, you know, I mean, uh, I hear sometimes or I read sometimes like, oh, this is how uh, uh, how we want the audience to see the film, or this is the way you should see it. Uh, in order to get, uh, you know, uh, or you know, because that's the way we want it. But but it's it. I don't I don't experience or I don't feel it like that. I I don't think that we. It's up to us to tell people how they should watch the film. It's much more up to us to feel that responsibility to make, you know, er, the, the, every version as good as we possibly can. So I would I would like to believe that it doesn't matter on what platform you watch it you always get that version that really um we have put a lot of extra attention into you know what I mean and um 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 yeah and I mean, in the end people just watch watch it exactly the way they 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 want to watch it and that's up to them and the only thing we can do is 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 to make it as good as we can, you know? I appreciate your practicality about that. Hoyta, uh, a final question for you. It's, it's one of the fun um, quirks of the Academy that the nominations come from the branches. But once the final voting happens, actors are voting on cinematography, writers are voting on cinematography. For those of us who are not subject matter experts, what should we be looking for in thinking about what makes uh, uh, really great cinematography. I'm sure it's beyond just the most beautiful images or the grandest vistas and scope of, of the scale. For me, cinematography is always beyond beautiful images. I, 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 I don't feel any sort of affection towards beautiful images. I think in the end, you know, you're trying to tell a story and people buy into that story or get engaged with that story. And that's kind of my, my work is enslaved to that, you know? So, so, <laughs> when somebody that doesn't know something about cinematography watches our film and you know loves the film and really buys into it and sits with this film and and ponders over it later i mean that's kind of my job well done you know uh i i always strive with my images that people kind of can forget about the technology and can forget about the fact that I'm lugging a big camera is not it, it's, it's not so that uh, people know that it was difficult and I lug a big camera. I lug that big camera because because I really believe that that that, that window is the the window that will give give the people the the best connection to the the essence of the story. So I would preferably have people know as little as possible about how difficult it is or how hard it is or how cool it is or how good it is or, you know, uh, I think, you know, proof is in the pudding, you know, the, uh, if people respond to it, then by all means. And, and, um, uh, uh, and then the other fault I have, of course, is like, you know, it's the, beautiful making, trying to make beautiful films or films that apply to, you know, hearts and souls of people. It's not a winners and losers game, you know? Yeah. So, uh, 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 you know, when people uh, have to vote, they have to kind of vote with their heart and their uh, their intuition. So. Well said. Well, I, I appreciate you wanting to keep the mystery in the process uh, and coming on to talk with us today. So I, it's been a great conversation. It's been fun talking to you, Hoida. Same. Thank you very much. Thanks. It was really nice. Great. Many thanks to Hoyta for joining us on the podcast today, and we wish him best of luck on March 10th at the 96th Academy Awards, which will be coming to you live from the Dolby Theater in Hollywood. And an extra special thanks to our friends at Universal for putting this conversation together in the midst of a very hectic award season. Oppenheimer is still playing in theaters, so be sure to check it out ahead of the Oscars. You can also rent or buy the film online in Dolby Vision, and it will be available on Peacock on February 16th. You'll find links to all those and more in our show notes. 
And speaking of awards, as I mentioned up top, this episode is part of our continuing coverage of the Academy Awards. If you'd like to hear more conversations with fellow Oscar nominees in this category and more, be sure you're subscribed to us, the Dolby Creator Talks podcast. Many of these awards are tough to pick and predict, and we will continue to offer these in-depth interviews filled with unique insights into the work of each of these nominated artists, which may make it just a little bit easier for you to fill out your Oscar ballot, whether you are an Academy voter or you simply want to do better in your annual Oscar office pool. If you're curious to know more about the Dolby Institute, head on over to dolbyinstitute.com. There you will find information about all of our programs. You can access the entire library of episodes of this podcast, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Until next time, thanks again for joining us. This is the Dolby Creator Talks podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with additional editing by Matt Nixon. And our production coordinator is Karen Marroquin. Thank you for joining us.